Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from around the world. I'm Keith Alper, Chairman of YPO Innovation Week, and thank you for joining us uh, live. Uh, we're really excited to kick this week off. Our first event has already taken place in Melbourne, Australia. We have to have some images and maybe even some questions from uh, down under. So uh, welcome to YPO Innovation Week and our YPO members and viewers on other, uh, on other channels. I'm really excited you're with us today. We've got a great program. Just a few things. Uh, first, I'd like to thank our partners and sponsors on YPO Innovation Week. Uh, as you know, YPO partners with Best in Class Partners, and we're very fortunate to have uh, four key sponsors to Innovation Week. First is Smartsheet. The CEO is a member, and he'll be speaking at a number of our events, Mark. Uh, NASDAQ, where we'll be closing the market on Friday. Um, we'll be ringing the bell and closing the market with our good friends at NASDAQ. Techstars, that we recently did a relationship with, and uh, we're going to be working with them on incubation, new memberships, and also launching them around the world. And last, uh, Microsoft Surface, and we're really excited to have Microsoft Surface, and they'll be hosting us in New York City to kind of look at the future of work and work platforms. So we're really excited and thank, thank those sponsors. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kate in a second here, but this is an interactive uh, cast. So Kate and Steve are going to chat, then we're going to take Q&A. Um, there's a raise hand feature at the bottom, and we'll probably speak for 20 or 25 minutes, but this gets great. If you interact, we can see you, we can hear you. Uh, Steve could talk to you, Kate could talk to you, those type of things. So um, we'll just get going here. And again, uh, thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, two other things, YPOInnovationWeek.com is where to get all your information on future casts and events going on around the world from Silicon Valley. Tel Aviv to Hong Kong, and uh, and so let's make it interactive and live. And I'm really excited with YPO's media partner CNBC, who we have a great relationship to introduce, and uh, our moderator uh, Kate Rogers, who has uh, been on tour last week, and she'll explain a little bit more. Kate, take it away, please. Hi, Keith. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I'm Kate Rogers. I'm CNBC's small business and entrepreneurship reporter, and I'm really excited to be joining you uh, today with Steve Case, and we're going to introduce him in just a minute. Uh, last week was National Small Business Week. We went all around the country talking to entrepreneurs outside of New York City and Silicon Valley, and I know that that's a topic that's close to Steve Case's heart, so let's just kick it off. We want to welcome and thank Steve Case for being here today. Steve, of course, is chairman and CEO of Revolution LLC. He's also founder and partner at Revolution Growth, also, of course, co-founder of AOL and chairman of the Case Foundation. Steve is a pioneer in making the internet a part of everyday life. He's also the author of the New York Times bestselling book, The Third Wave, an Entrepreneur's Vision of the Future. So, Steve, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And to kick it off, why don't you tell everyone who might not be familiar with it, what is The Third Wave? Well, great. First of all, it's great to be with everybody. Uh, good morning from Washington, D.C. I know it's afternoon and evening for other people in other places, but it's a great event. I'm glad that you know, YPO is focusing on innovation and doing it in, the, in this way. And it ties in with a, the with a question, the, the, the three waves of the Internet. We've seen two of them. Now we're starting to see the third emerge. The first was just getting everybody you know, connected. We started America Online uh, in this area. Uh, in 1985, so 32 years ago, only 3% of people were online, and those 3% were only online one hour a week. So it really was early days. We wanted to get America online. We wanted to get the world online. And that first wave was really building the on-ramps to get people connected and educating people about why they would want to get connected. So it went, went from in the, that mid-'80s time frame where essentially nobody knew about the Internet or cared about the Internet uh, to by the end of the first wave of the year 2000 or so, uh, essentially, everybody was connected and couldn't live without it. That sort of set the stage for the second wave of the internet, when, as all, all you know, because many of you are involved in it, and really has been building software and services on top of the internet. That first wave really built the core infrastructure, so the, the center of gravity for the second wave shifted to building apps on top of the internet, particularly on, on, on smartphones. So, it's, of course, Facebook and Twitter and many other things became popular uh, in the second wave. It was really mostly about the, you know, the software. The third wave is really the next logical step. Uh, and it's really integrating the internet in, in seamless and pervasive, sometimes even invisible ways throughout our lives. And the process, you know, changed how we think about healthcare and education, energy, transportation, food, agriculture, you know, pretty important parts of our lives, pretty big sectors of the economy. Healthcare alone is one sixth of the economy. And they changed a little bit in the first wave and the second wave, but all, not that much. And they're going to change a lot in the third wave. And the reason I wrote the, the book is because I, I believe that the skill set, the roadmap uh, for success for innovation in the third wave is going to be different than 
and then the second wave, and but can learn some lessons from from the first wave. That's such a great point, and, and I know you just recently re-released uh, a paperback edition of this after the 2016 election, and it has a new chapter in it, and it includes what you're calling the restart agenda. So can you tell our viewers a bit about that agenda and also why it was important for you to include that in a new version of the book? Well, the original book, uh, The Hardback, came out just about a year ago and did, thankfully did well, and, and as a result, got a lot of you know, feedback from people who read it. And said, what about this? What about that? And I want to add you know, something here. We had a question there. So we did a kind of rewrite of, of good parts of the book, but we did add a whole new chapter that was sort of a, an agenda moving forward. How do we remain the most innovative entrepreneurial nation in the world, which is, as many people know, because you know, YPO is global, there's a lot of recognition now that you know, entrepreneurship is sort of the secret sauce that built America. I remind people here in DC that 250 years ago, America itself was a startup. It was really just an idea, kind of a fragile idea at that. But the reason we're now the leader of the free world because we have a leading economy because it was entrepreneurs uh, who really led the way first in the agricultural revolution then the industrial revolution obviously more recently the technology revolution so we have to continue to lead the way that includes things like there's seven parts that i lay out in the book but things like reforming the way washington works with, with startups how do you strike the right balance in terms of regulation there should be some regulations around things like food safety or drug safety or what the rules of the road should be for driverless cars on our streets or drones in, in the skies. But if, it's, if the regulations are, are, are too heavy handed, then it stifles the innovation in the early early stages of this. So how do you strike the right balance in terms of regulation, in terms of you know, keeping the bad things from happening while also enabling you know, the good things happen? How do we rethink our education system? A lot of people have been working on this for, for many years. I'm sure some some who are Kind of listening in are, are part of this, but we really need to you know, recognize that the skill set for the third wave is going to be different. Uh, two of the things I think are going to be particularly different in the third wave is going to be much more important to have partnerships. It's not so much about the software. That's sort of the table stakes to get into the, the game to build the initial product or the initial service, but partnerships are going to be much more important in the third wave. You really want to revolutionize healthcare. It's not about the app and the app store. It's about how you work with doctors and engage with hospitals and partner with health plans. And so this skill around partnership and collaboration uh, is going to be uh, you know, important. How, how do we teach more of that in our skills? And the other one is, is this issue of policy, regulations. These are, these are regulated sectors. How do you understand that and, and deal with some of the dynamics? So rethinking education, how do we instill more creativity, how to encourage more you know, uh, collaboration or is, is going to be important as well. Another that's uh, it's a really uh, you know, significant deal is how do you create more regional entrepreneurship? How do you uh, level the playing field so everybody everywhere who has an idea has a real you know, shot at turning that into a, uh, you know, a company? So how do you transform different you know, ecosystems? Not try to replicate Silicon Valley, but learn from Silicon Valley and try to create you know, robust ecosystems all around the country indeed. Uh, all around the, the world. So those are some of the last one I'd say that it's worth pointing out, particularly with this group is immigration. How do we how do we win what's now a global battle for talent and how we continue to be a magnet for talent? And immigration is a complicated issue, not just in this country, but you know, many countries, a sensitive issue and a, for many an emotional issue. But you know, the reality is we need to continue to lead the way there. You know, in this country, 40% of our Fortune 500 companies were started by immigrants. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we, there's a history here. You know, Apple would not have started if it hadn't been for Steve Jobs being a son of a Syrian refugee. Google would not have started had it not been for Sergey Brin being the son of a you know, Russian immigrant. How do we continue to be a magnet for, you know, for talent and, and really encourage people who come here for great educations to stay here and make it easier for them to stay here with things like the, the startup uh, visa provision. So there's a bunch of things that, that need, to, need to happen. And even as we start looking at uh, the tax code and rethinking how to simplify the tax code, I think there needs to be a bias on job creation and particularly a bias in terms of more capital focused on, on supporting startups. So a bunch of things that need to be done, which is why I added that chapter to the book. Yeah, absolutely. Very insightful uh, chapter. And I'm sure readers are, are glad that you did add it. What do you think the Trump administration means for entrepreneurship? What do you think lies ahead in the next four years? Well, the jury's out. Uh, the, 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 on the positive side, that's why there's been a Trump rally post, uh, post election. I think surprised a lot of people. I think the sense that he's going to take a, a fresh look to things like regulation, make sure it doesn't stifle innovation, I think is, uh, is encouraging. The fact is he's indicated a, a desire to kind of figure out a way to kind of simplify the tax system and in general have lower taxes, particularly have a tax system that's more consistent with what's happening you know, globally. I think that that's been you know, you know, kind of well received. At the same time, on on the areas to be concerned, frankly, I think some of the things he said during the 
campaign around immigration were, I think, uh, unhelpful and un frankly un unfortunate. So what happens there? Is, is there a pivot there? Hopefully uh, you know, there will be. And, and also I think there needs to be a, a little less focus on uh, what I would consider more of the photo ops, like uh, you know, kind of 700 jobs at a carrier factory in the middle of the country, and more focused on, on, on telling the stories of entrepreneurs and making it easier for the entrepreneurs who can create the carriers of tomorrow or the Googles of tomorrow or the Under Armors of, of tomorrow or you know, all these different you know, sectors which are ripe for disruption. So a little more focus on, the, on startups in the future, a little less focus on kind of turning back the clock would be helpful. But it's early, early days. I've now lived in Washington over three decades. So I've seen administrations come and go and I kind of try to be pretty kind of nonpartisan or at least bipartisan, you know, try to get people kind of working together. And so it's just been a few months and they're still kind of assembling the team and clarifying priorities. And so it's still a little bit of the, the sea leg stage. So I, I think you know, hopefully as things go forward, there'll be more focus on startups and entrepreneurs and particularly more focus on regional entrepreneurship. How do you kind of lift up the entrepreneurs in, in different parts of the country? You mentioned deregulation, and in reporting on small business, that's something you hear, whether it's a tech company or even a mom and pop retailer. Deregulation is always top of mind for small companies. And, and I saw you wrote about Uber as an example uh, of the third wave, and they're kind of ask for forgiveness and not permission take on how they were going right. to kind of go up against local governments and kind of buck the trend. But you wrote that it, the onus should really be on the government to make it easier for companies like this. Uh, is that something that you foresee happening? Because Donald Trump has promised deregulation. Do you think it will be easier for the Ubers, for example, of the world under this new administration? Well, my guess, uh, first of all, I think it depends. There's some kind of broader kind of horizontal things around regulation, such as securities regulation. Hopefully there's some you know, a simpler approach around things like crowdfunding. The Congress passed the Jobs Act five years ago, legalized use of the internet to raise money, you know, you know, the idea of crowdfunding. Uh, but it took the SEC four years to write the rule. I think it was 800 pages, so it's a little overly complex, maybe a little overly onerous. So that's an area of a, uh, maybe there's a, is a way to, you know, again, keep the bad things from happening. Obviously, investing in startups is risky, so people need to understand the, the, the risk and need to make sure they're not investing more than they frankly going to afford to lose. So that has to be part of it. But also, how do you use crowdfunding as a way to level a playing field? Because not everybody knows somebody who has a connection to a you know, kind of a venture capitalist. Not everybody has family money or knows people who have you know, money they can you know, donate it or invest as, as angel investors. So crowdfunding is important. And then you have to look at the various sectors, whether it be you know, fintech or ag tech or health tech or these different things. And, and how do you try to enable more innovation? I, I think that will be a, a bias at the same time. These are complicated issues. So I think it's going to require the innovators to work more collaboratively, more constructively with the regulators and, and policymakers if we're going to kind of get this right. And Uber, you, you mentioned, I, I worry sometimes that Uber... You know, the lesson from Uber for entrepreneurs is that if you just ignore the laws mm -hmm. and just launch in the market and you get enough market you know, acceptance and then can use consumers kind of as advocates to kind of prevail, that that's, that's the key. And obviously it worked extremely well for them, you know, um, unbelievably well for them. They, they won most of the battles. They lost a few. But that's because the battles, for, at least in this country, were highly localized. It really was city by city. So, for example, they're still shut down in a city like Austin, but they're available in, in most cities. But I think they're still shut down in countries like Germany and South Korea and others. So I think they, they and even they, now in this building, I'm in a Revolution the Investment Company is based here in Washington, D.C. In the same building, three floors are Uber. Uh, now has a significant presence in, in, in Washington. I think that, that what way they were able to get away with it, partly because it was highly localized and partly because the rules that they were fighting were basically viewed by most people as things that were you know, putting the incumbents, the existing taxi companies, trying to kind of protect them and favor them, not necessarily do what's in the, the consumer interest. And so a combination of the highly diffused local nature of regulation and the fact they're taking on a, a regulation that most people didn't think was necessary, reasonable, or fair is why they were successful. That's not going to work in the third wave. If you're going to launch a medical device, uh, or drugs, or you're going to be providing food to you know to schools, or you're going to have you know kind of drones in the sky, et cetera. There's going to need to be some regulation even before you can launch the product. You cannot launch a drug that's you know you can inflame people. You're going to save people's lives until you've passed them some tests. You've kind of jumped through some uh, some some hurdles. So that dynamic is going to shift in the third way, which is why these issues around policy and regulations are going to become 
you know, more important. So I, I give, you know, hats off to Uber for being such a, you know, unbelievable success. I think they're now trying to, you know, kind of catch up and, and figure out ways to, you know, provide the right kind of, you know, policy kind of framework. And, and so they can be a little more constructive. Airbnb similarly, you know, last week, you know, cut a deal. Uh, and, you know, I think it was in New York to try to, you know, kind of kind of simplify the rules of the road and agree on what was going to happen or maybe it was San Francisco. Uh, so they, they're starting to realize that the a strategy of launching and, 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 and trying to get away as much as they can and take as much ground as they can, you know, only goes so far, uh, then they need to, you know, engage. I think in the third wave, the engagement's going to have to happen sooner uh, or the entrepreneurs won't even get, get through the starting gate. You, you mentioned crowdfunding, which is, is instrumental for so many small companies when they're getting off the ground, because as you said, not everybody has access to friends and family fundraising opportunities or even traditional loans from banks. It can be tough. So you helped to pass the 2012 Jobs Act. We've seen it come you know, quite a way since then, but obviously there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of crowdfunding and some of the onerous regulations on entrepreneurs when it comes to their ability to raise under the law. What would you like to see shifted? Well, it goes back to saying earlier, it's more simplification. That, 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 that acknowledging some of the risks of crowdfunding, as, as I said, but also acknowledging it is a way to help level the playing field. The data here is pretty interesting. That last year, nearly 80% of venture capital went to three states, California, New York, and Massachusetts, 80%. Last year, 90% of venture capital went to men, only 10% to women, 1% went to African American. So, you know, the playing field is not level. It does matter where you live. It does matter who you know. It does matter what you look like. It just does. You know, the data is is pretty clear on that. So, how do we, you know, level the playing field in terms of of opportunity? Crowdfunding is one way, not the only way, but one way to do that. And the evidence there is if you look at the the you know, the project crowdfunding sites like a, a Kickstarter, Indiegogo, about 40% of their successful projects have a female founder or co-founder versus 10%, you know, kind of getting venture cap, which says to me, if it really is about the idea, people are on Kickstarter or looking at a video and saying, well, that's an interesting product and not necessarily kind of focused on the, you know, the people behind the product, it tends to level the playing field. So that's why I think crowdfunding, you know, can be a game changer if you're an entrepreneur who doesn't happen to be in Silicon Valley or didn't happen to go to Stanford, didn't happen to have the, you know, the, you know, the, the you know, the, the, the connections, the network, if, if you will. I think crowdfunding, which, which is more, a little bit more of a meritocracy based on the idea and can level the playing field in terms of opportunity will be you know, very important. So it's, it's really making sure that, that it's allowed to flourish, that entrepreneurs understand what it is, that the portals that provide Crowdfunding do provide sufficient, you know, kind of safeguards and education and, and so forth. Uh, but we don't just worry about trying to keep the bad things from happening, which I think was too much of the SEC bias. But we also, you know, try to figure out how to enable good things to happen, get more entrepreneurs and more places funded. And some of those will end up starting up and being the, you know, the next big successes of, of, of tomorrow. Every, every big company starts as a little company. So if you can back more of these little companies, obviously YPO you know, members understand this because, you know, many of them are, are, are founders of, of, of companies and have been you know, kind of seen, been part of this entrepreneurial journey. How do we get more people on that playing field? Uh, and we can only do that if we're, we're more inclusive in terms of how we think about entrepreneurship, both in terms of place and also different kinds of people. So that brings me to Rise of the Rest, and I've traveled all over the country, and like I mentioned to you before, we've been to many of the places that you've been to. I've even profiled Mati Energy, uh, Soul Power in Pittsburgh, so companies that you've put some uh, capital behind, which is really neat, and I'm excited to talk to you about that. So you've just wrapped up your fifth tour, I believe, Omaha, right. Denver, Salt Lake City, Albuquerque, Phoenix. Those places are not New York City, not Silicon right. Valley. Tell people who are watching why it's so important to get out there and see people who might be in middle America, might be off the coast, and, and talk to us about some of the amazing things that are happening there, because I think we can certainly be in a bubble, um, as evidenced by this election, that you know this country is much more than New York City and San Francisco. So why is it important to get out there, meet those people, see what they're doing, and then foster entrepreneurship there? Well, I think it really is, you know, the story of America. I mean, this is, this is a country with 50 states and there's you know, different states have different dynamics and different expertise and different, you know, perspectives and they should all be part of the innovation and economy. They all should be part of the, you know, the, the future. And, and we've seen this ebb and flow. There's been an arc, not surprisingly, of, of sort of, the, of innovation, you know, uh, you know, 75 years ago, the, the hottest city in terms of innovation in the country, kind of the Silicon Valley of its time was Detroit. Mm -hmm. When Detroit was was you know the car was the hot technology and Detroit was rocking and rolling and and, and Pittsburgh 
you know, was, a, was very you know, successful, you know, 75 years ago, 100 years ago, really powering the Industrial Revolution, the steel capital, really good at get making, making things. So the, the Silicon Valley is actually a relatively recent phenomenon, really the last you know, half century. And it's great. And the people are in Silicon Valley. It's awesome. And, and there's a fearless culture and anything is possible and you know, a high degree of, of kind of network density. And, and you know, the risk is, is, is understood and encouraged. And if you fail at something, you're not a failure. That just didn't work. And you keep going. And, and maybe the next thing is going to you know, work better. There's a lot of things to you know, love and celebrate about you know, Silicon Valley. And we're seeing you know, strong development you know, still in the Boston area. New York City has emerged, particularly in the last you know, decade, in, in, in the digital space in, in, a, in a very you know, you know, powerful way. So good for them and, and you know, power to them. But how do we make sure entrepreneurs everywhere really do have a, a shot at the, uh, the American dream? And, and that's what the Rise of the Rest initiative is all about. We've now visited, I think it's 26 cities by bus, so it's 6,000 miles. And you mentioned the recent tour. Previously, we were in places like Detroit and Pittsburgh and Nashville and Cincinnati and Madison and Minneapolis and New, or New Orleans and St. Louis and, you know, Kansas City, a lot of different cities that all have their own kind of, you know, perspective, their own expertise. I think that's going to tie in with the, with, with the third wave because I think domain expertise actually going to become important again. And the second wave, you'd often hear that, that the reason an entrepreneur was successful is they brought a, a, a naive, fresh perspective to a problem. PayPal, for example, you know, said they, the reason they were successful is they didn't have any experience working for a credit card company. As a result, they could ask questions in new ways and, and imagine things in new ways and, and you know, created, created a very disruptive model. I understand that. I think that aspect's important. But in the third wave, I think you have to marry that with some domain expertise. If you really want to revolutionize healthcare, probably kind of important not just to know how to code, but also to understand the dynamic of how doctors and hospitals work. If you really want to revolutionize farming with, with ag tech, understanding how farmers work and, and, and how, they, how they think is going to become you know, much more important. If you really want to reimagine, revolutionize you know, education, some of that's going to happen with apps and the cloud, Khan Academy, things like that. But a lot of still happen in the classroom. So how do you create more personalized, adaptive approaches to learning? That's just not just about the technology. It's also about you know, understanding those, those things. And that's you know, the rise of the rest. You'll see places like St. Louis or Louisville or, or Lincoln are, have a lot of expertise in, in farming. Monsanto, one of the largest ag companies, is, happens to be in in St. Louis and healthcare, Baltimore, because of Johns Hopkins and, and uh, uh, Under Armour or Nashville or Cleveland or many other cities are emerging as kind of hotbeds around kind of health uh, innovation. So marrying that expertise uh, and having some history in a sector to the fresh perspective that the entrepreneurs can, can, can bring, I think is going to be the, the key uh, to, to be successful in, in the third wave. So I think the rest will rise. We're just trying to do what we can to make it a little easier for the entrepreneurs in these rise of the rest cities to, to get the initial capital they, they need, to get the partnerships they need, to get the media spotlight they need. So I, I think it's terrific that you're you know, hitting the road and, and telling the stories of these rise of the rest entrepreneurs. And, and one thing I'd like to ask you, because I'm sure you see kind of a shift among people who are from outside of those areas moving there because of people like yourself and the investments that you're making and the media attention that you bring. And, you know, some of what we do, too, is highlighting these opportunities right. and options for people. Do you think that there is a continuing shift and do you think it's gaining momentum that you don't necessarily have to be in New York or San Francisco to do this? And in fact, you might be able to better leverage some of these resources and your money will go a little further. And even investors are looking outside of those areas for new ideas. I see it myself right. more and more. I'm curious what you think. It's beginning to happen. It's still early days. It's still, you know, when we talk about, you know, entrepreneurship in the middle of the country and talk about what entrepreneurs are doing in, in places like, you know, Detroit or, or, or Cincinnati, other places, there are folks I talk to who are in San Francisco or New York who are kind of skeptical and, and, and think that the momentum is so strong and that increasing returns dynamic is in, in a place like Silicon Valley is so strong. It's hard to imagine that you can really build a, a significant company and attract the capital, attract the talent and the in the middle of the country, but more people, as they realize what's happening, they are be, you know, beginning to make, you know, see what, see, start making some investments. You know, for one example in Indianapolis, there's a company called Exact Target that was recently acquired for about three billion dollars by Salesforce. They have nearly two thousand employees in, in Indianapolis. We backed at Revolution recently, a company called Uptake in Chicago, just started three years ago. Now they're, you know, coming up on a thousand employees, including nearly a hundred kind of, you know, data scientists. Under Armour, I mentioned in Baltimore, has thousands of employees really under, you know, expertise, not just in, in fitness and, and, and clothing, but also moving into you know, health tech, different software and, and devices and, 
and, and different kind of things. So I think the awareness is building, but it's still early days. There's still you know some evangelism required. It frankly reminds me of 30 years ago when we were just starting America Online and just you know talking about the idea of the internet, which of course we all take for granted. Even something like this that you know kind of we don't you know this kind of this this week around innovation using you know video from different locations. You know, in those early days, most people didn't believe that people would ever want to get online. They thought it'd be limited to sort of a hobbyist kind of market. It never would be a a mass market. So I, I lived through a decade of that skepticism before finally the internet took off. Finally, companies like AOL could rise. So I, I, I'm comfortable living in this area of skepticism with the rise of the rest, but I've seen enough examples, uh, and I, I feel like the you know, momentum is starting to build. It goes back to what you said around talent. When many of these cities I visited, the story is they've had a brain drain of talent. The people who grew up in these cities felt they had to move to the coast to pursue an opportunity. Uh, they're beginning to, that brain drain is beginning to slow. You're seeing in some of these cities, people are graduating from some of these places like Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh or ASU in, in, in Phoenix are saying, you know, I, I think I would like to stay here. I don't feel like I have to, to move. And in some places, we're also seeing the beginning, it's still early, but the beginning of a boomerang of talent where people grew up in, in one of those places or went to school in one of those places but moved away. Uh, now feel like it's time to move back. The winner of our Rise of the Rest uh, pitch competition, for example, in Detroit, I actually started this company in San Francisco, moved to Detroit, part because, you mentioned, as you mentioned, cost of living was lower, and part because he was from Detroit and wanted to raise his family there, and part because he wanted to be part of the story of the, the resurgence, the renaissance of, of Detroit. So for all those reasons, you know, he did, I'm starting to see more and more of that. So there's still a lot of work to do. Still, as I said, nearly 80% of capital last year went to – California, New York, and Massachusetts, 50% alone went to California. So there's still a lot of work to kind of level the playing field and help entrepreneurs in other places. So Steve, I have one more question for you before we get to the live Q&A, but I do want to remind people that they can type them in the, the chat, their questions. You can also click on the participants icon and then click raise your hand to ask your question live on camera, which is pretty cool because you also can talk to Steve Case. Uh, with Revolution, you say you're investing in companies that are built to last, not built to flip. I love that. I think it's great. Um, I also want to know how quickly you know if something's built to last versus built to flip. I mean, obviously, you're, you know what you're doing. You know what you're looking for. But how quickly can you tell? Well, it depends on the stage. Are you, we have you know, basically three groups here with the Rise of Rest team focused on these early stage seed and investments. And we have a Revolution Ventures group that focuses on Series A and, and B investments. And then we have a later stage Revolution Growth team that think focused on smart startups, what we think of as, as speed up. So the, the way we think about it is, is different in each case. And obviously, there are situations where it makes sense for a company to, you know, to, to be acquired. And, and, and you know, we certainly have seen that in many instances. Uh, but what we're really saying is we have a bias towards taking on big problems, backing entrepreneurs with big, bold ideas. And we rec recognize sometimes that takes a while. Sometimes revolutions happen in more evolutionary ways. We saw that with, with AOL. That it really was a decade before we finally broke through. And then in the mid-90s, everybody thought we were like this overnight sensation. We've been at it for more than a decade when nobody really caring about it or, or noticing it or, or, you know, or being highly skeptical of before it finally broke through. So we're a little bit more willing to back those, uh, you know, those ideas. And we also have a bias towards you know, backing entrepreneurs who really want to build significant, durable, independent companies. So mm -hmm. we eventually take the company you know, kind of public. That's sort of our, our, our bias. So we, at the same time, we're happy to you know, celebrate any entrepreneur trying to do anything anywhere. And that's, you know, we think is part of what's made this country uh, so great. So we just have a bias in terms of some of these third wave sectors that are really impacting important aspects of our lives. We have a bias in terms of place, the, the rise of rest. We're a little more enthusiastic about back an entrepreneur in the middle of the country, not just the, you know, California, New York, because all the other investors are focusing on California and New York. We have a bias towards the, the entrepreneurs where partnerships, strategic partnerships are are going to be important, and we have a bias to entrepreneurs where the policy aspects are, are going to be important. So place and partnership and, and, and policy are some of the things that we, we look for in these in these third wave uh, entrepreneurs, as, as well as willing to take the long view and recognize entrepreneurship as a team sport. It's not really about the entrepreneurs, how you assemble the right team uh, to, to take on that problem and hopefully change the world. And one more question for you before we get to the live Q&A. You said you dealt with skeptics for over a decade, and if you didn't persist, we wouldn't be having this conversation here right now. What's your best piece of advice for someone who feels like they're being doubted or their idea doesn't have validation or they're not good enough or your idea is better than mine? Uh, what would you say to someone who's in that position? 
Well, it's always tricky because there are situations where people try something and really believe in it, and it turns out it's not a good idea. It turns out, you know, you know it's just for some reason it's not a good idea. So having, you know, be understand what the market's telling you, what, understand what's happening in the competitive you know, landscape, uh, you know, makes sense. And sometimes it does make sense to back up. The, you know, Travis, founder of Uber, the first two companies were, were not that successful. One was a total failure. One was a very modest success. Uh, Uber was 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 very successful. If you stuck with one of those early ones, you know, we wouldn't have Uber. So there are times where it makes sense to kind of take a step back and 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 you know, reckon, you know acknowledge that it's not it's not meant to be. But there are also times where it is a good idea. It just is taking some time. In retrospect, the reason it took so long for the internet to take off is clear. When I was in my mid twenties and and thought the obvi idea was obvious and thought everybody should get connected and thought it was going to have this transformative impact, I couldn't understand why it was so hard to get people to, to pay attention, so hard to get people to to join. But in retrospect, back then most people didn't have personal computers. The, most of the people who had personal computers didn't have a modem. Remember back then you had to go to the peripheral section of the computer store to buy this thing called the modem <laughs> to turn into a communicating device. It was kind of be viewed as, the internet was kind of viewed as optional, non-essential, peripheral. If you were able to you know, get online, you actually had one of those you know, PCs with one of those modems and you could connect. It was really hard. The software was really complicated. It was about $10 an hour to be connected. So that's kind of, kind of intimidating. Once you got online, there was really nothing to do and nobody to talk to. It was still the, you know, the, the early days. So in, in retrospect, there was a reason why it was, it was kind of slow going. Uh, but, but in that particular instance, the idea of the internet, we knew was a powerful idea. We just need to you know, figure out ways to make the service easier to use, more useful, more fun, more affordable, establish the right partnerships, you know, figure out the right kind of, you know, policy, you know, kind of framework. So that was an instance where it really made sense to stick with. I think that's going to be much more common in the, in the third wave. Healthcare is hard. And, and if you really think you're going to have an overnight success in healthcare, I think you're going to be disappointed. Education is hard. You know, these sectors that are third wave sectors, they are some of the most important aspects of our lives. How do we, you know, move around cities and how do we stay healthy and how do our kids learn and what, how do we eat? And these are pretty basic, you know, fundamental things. And, and, the, and the, the systems in place are going to be more complicated to disrupt. And so it's going to require more patience, it's require more perseverance, it's require more, more partners, it's require more of that kind of long-term, uh, you know, term view. So just understanding where you are and, and, and being honest with yourself about, you know, the data you're getting. And in some cases, it means abandon your idea. In some cases, it means pivot your idea. But in some cases, it means just stick with your idea. It is a good idea. You just have to figure out ways to, you know, kind of, you know, adjust the context in which you're operating so that idea can, can flourish. All right. Well, I could ask you questions all day, but I don't want to be selfish. So we're going to bring in some of the live questions here. So I think we're going to go to Rodrigo first. We can bring him up. I'm a social entrepreneur from uh, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and I'm very interested to know uh, how do you align your vision of the third wave of internet in, your, in the case foundation or in your uh, philanthropic uh, investments from the case foundation? Well, thank you for asking the question. The, the, the case foundation and revolution have the same mission statement, which is we invest in people and ideas that can change the world. Sometimes we think it's best done through investing in a startup and, you know, investment capital, equity, you know, capital. Sometimes we think it's, it's better done through investing in, in sort of the social sector and nonprofits and particularly doing partnerships, public-private partnerships. And a big focus now is on inclusive entrepreneurship. We launched the Case Foundation initiative last year called Faces of Founders, hashtag, you know, Faces of Founders, trying to shine a spotlight on this broader, more diverse, more inclusive mix of of, of entrepreneurs that we're trying to promote. We've also been big advocates there, uh, particularly my wife, Jean, who runs the Case Foundation of Impact Investing. How do you have, have a new new form of, of entrepreneurship where, of course, profit makes sense, but also purpose makes sense, and measuring impact in, in, in these companies is going to become increasingly uh, important. So we, we view, you know, kind of trying to use, you know, all, all the tools in the toolbox, if you will, to to deal with these issues, but and, and we've evolved the Case Foundation now. I've been around almost 20 years. We think of it a little bit like a venture capital operation, where we do something for five or so years and, and try to be a catalyst, and then kind of hand off the batons. In the early days, we did things around trying to close the digital divide. We did a lot of things around using the internet for civic engagement. We did some things around you know, kind of cancer research. Now, a big focus is on inclusive entrepreneurship and and impact in investing. And we do that mostly in the United States, but we've also done a number of things uh, 
around the world. We helped launch a venture capital fund in the West Bank uh, because we really believe that the, the only path, I think, to stability and, and, and peace in that, in that region is creating more hope and, and opportunity. We've done it last year. We made a, a trip actually as part of a, a group with President Obama uh, to, to Africa uh, and made a number of investments in, in, in Kenya and Nigeria and, and, and other, uh, other countries. So we've done some you know, kind of global investments. We're also partners with investors in Endeavor and, and part of their Catalyst Fund is doing some, some really interesting things. But our, our primary focus is on the United States and trying to do everything we can, to, you know, as I said earlier, to level the playing field so everybody everywhere really does have a shot at the American dream and we're backing a next generation of, uh, of entrepreneurs and, and really trying and both through the, what, the direct work we're doing and with, with the revolution and the, and the sector building work we're trying to do with, with the Case Foundation. Okay, thank you so much, Rodrigo, for asking that one. And I think we have another one, Steve, here from Pappy. He's next for our live question. So we can bring him up, please. Good morning, Steve. Can you hear me? Good morning. How are you? I'm on the West Coast, a bit early out here. Um, my question yeah. revolves around the small market. I'm uh, YPO Canada at large, Victoria, BC. So we're on the right coast. Um, and just trying to figure out how do we drive the um, the stop the brain drain locally and what can we do in our own communities to inspire people to stay local instead of taking off to places like Vancouver, Silicon Valley, Seattle? Well, I think it's a great question and a lot of things happening and, and if you can look at our risetherest.com you know, website, we have some you know, some ideas of some of the things we, we've done to try to kind of create this, this, this stronger startup of communities. Brad Feld is going to be a speaker later this week, and, and he's done a number of, of things through Techstars and also some books around you know, building startup uh, communities. But I think some of it, it just gets back to creating that network density. But we, as we travel around the, the country, we found that there are people doing interesting things in these, in these communities, but often they don't have that connection. They don't have that, that the network that they, you see in places like Silicon Valley. So getting people to work together, getting people to understand what each other is doing, getting people to you know, collaborate more is important. And then again, part of that is engaging the big companies in those cities to work with the small companies. That's one of the things I talk about in, in, in my book, The Third Wave, is how do the big companies help the small companies in the process, the small companies help the big companies stay more relevant, more agile, and, and, and more innovative. So the, the, the big companies can't just be sitting on the sidelines looking at the startup sector with skepticism or, or curiosity. They have to be engaging and, and how do you get the universities to basically take ideas they have you know move them out of the labs into the marketplace get them in the hands of of entrepreneurs encourage more entrepreneurship when people are on campus keep provide pathways on ramps including sometimes alumni investment capital to some to allow some of those people who want to you know stay connected to the university stay in that city you know, to, to stay there and then you does you know the on the policy side it does matter what the mayors and governors and other other kind of people are are doing really celebrating you know, the work of entrepreneurs and, and trying to create that sense of possibility, which then becomes more of a magnet for, for investors to, you know, get on planes and, and, and visit the cities. And, and then you have to kind of you know, fight this and it's a difficult you know, challenge, but then you start seeing some, some, some break yeah. successes and then people are, are following those and, and, and then it gets a little bit easier over time. But it's not so much just telling investors in California, New York to spend more time in these other places. It's getting people in those other places to really, you know, celebrate the startups and work together, and a YPO can play a, a critical, you know, view. Obviously, a, 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 an instrumental view in making this happen. So, creating more of that network as YPO already has, and saying that part of their focus is in in any particular you know, city such as yours is how do you in the next two three years create more momentum around the startup community in your city, you know, and, and do what you can to be the leader in connecting the dots and creating that that network uh, that could really be transformative. Thank you, Thank Pat, you. for asking that question. Uh, Steve, we've got another one here from S. Magenis. This is a type-in question, so I'm going to ask it for him. So he says, Steve, as you know, YPO operates in 130 countries with the rise of AI, artificial intelligence. What are the uniquely human qualities that AI cannot replicate and we as CEOs should be starting to consider? It's a great question, and there's a lot of debate and, frankly, a lot of, of angst around AI and some other technologies, robotics, driverless cars, other kinds of things that, you know, how is that going to impact the workforce? How, how, how is it going to, you know, what kind of jobs are going to be lost and what can we then do with, with people who lose those jobs? I think it's a very 
important discussion to have. My, my response is, is that we don't know exactly how those are going to play out. We don't know exactly the pace of what's going to, you know, kind of how that's going to play out. But it's, it's incumbent on us to do everything we can now to be backing new ideas now, some of which will be not just companies, but the industries of tomorrow that will create lots of jobs. 50 years ago, if you'd said the internet was going to you know, be a force, most people, as I said, would not have agreed with that. There wasn't a belief that it would, you know, was a viable idea turned into be a pretty significant industry. What are the industries that are you know, able to do that? More, more specifically, in, in terms of AI, you know, what are the skills that you know, essentially computers can't easily replicate? And it goes back to some of the things I talked about you know, before, the creativity, kind of imagining new possibilities. It's going to be a little harder for AI to do that. It's a great way to you know, kind of analyze a, a data and, and make a you know, bunch of uh, algorithmic kind of predictions. But there's going to be a creativity aspect that I think the machines are going to be you know, more, more challenged to, to, to do. And some of these things also around collaboration are going to become critically important. It was not just about the technology, but how it gets integrated with these third wave sectors, the skills around collaboration are going to become you know, much more important. So that's why, uh, even though there's a big push and should be a big push in our schools around STEM topics and encouraging more people to go into coding, not everybody wants to go into coding, not everybody's going to be good at going into coding. And it's not just about the coding, it's not just about the software, it's not just about the, the technology. So also focusing on some of these skills around you know, creativity and collaboration makes sense. And then for anybody running a company, I think the challenge is how do you lean in the future? How do you recognize that your know, world is changing, including you know war, your world? And many you know successful companies started because they were the disruptors, they were the attackers. Over time, sometimes they slip into being the defenders. And I talk about in this book that happened with AOL. We were the attacker and really kind of kind of taken on the world and at our peak. About half of all the U.S. internet traffic went through AOL, but then we slipped into being more of a defender uh, and kind of lost some of that you know, entrepreneurial you know, mojo. So I can incumbent on all the you know, companies or the you know, YPO members are, 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 are leading to, to really kind of take, you know, take the next step, lean in the future, go where the, the puck is going, and really imagine what if you were that disruptive entrepreneur, how would you be attacking your, your company, your sector, your industry, and then put those plays in place pr proactively uh, and aggressively uh, so that you can be part of the future as opposed to be left behind. Great. I love that answer. And I'm thankful you said that not everybody's brain works as a coder because I know mine definitely didn't work that way for sure. And that's why I'm a journalist. So I think embracing, you know, your own skill set and your own talents is definitely important. We have another uh, live question from David Wilkinson. So can we bring in David, please? Yes. Yes. Hello. Uh, thank you, Steve. Um, David Wilkinson here from uh, YPO Gold in London. Um, you started your discussion today by reference, referencing uh, Donald Trump. Uh, we've got a new government in the UK, which is very much trying to encourage the idea that Britain's going to be a, a, a very entrepreneur, entrepreneurship and, and, and full of entrepreneurs, growing economy. Uh, obviously, we've got Brexit coming up, so it's quite important to us. Right. I guess my question is, is around the extent that government has a role to play in encouraging entrepreneurship in its country. Generally, when I've talked to entrepreneurs about this, all they want government to do is, is to leave them alone. So I, right. so I just wonder whether you feel that, that government has a role uh, to help entrepreneurship, or should they just leave entrepreneurs alone? No, I understand. I understand the sentiment. By the way, I do think the UK is, is well positioned, particularly London, well positioned. There's been a lot of time with the current mayor and the previous you know, mayor, and I think there's good momentum. The Brexit thing is a little concerning. I think it's created a little bit of a chill in terms of at least capital, and, and you know, people are worried about what happens with with you know talent and immigration and, and the and more broadly in in Europe. But I still think the momentum, and particularly in some sectors like you know, fintech and others, is really quite you know, robust there. I understand the, the the bias that most entrepreneurs have about you know, it's like it's hard enough to start in a company. You know, I just wish the government would stay out of the way and let me do do my thing. I understand that it, it's un, it's it's perfectly understandable. At the same time, as you think about these third wave sectors, I think it's unrealistic and unwise to presume there won't be some government engagement. There and there should be some government engagement. I'm generally in favor of less government, lighter touch kind of you know regulation. But at the same time, I actually think there should be regulations around you know, drugs that, you know, we're going to, you know, give to our, our parents or food that we're going to feed to our, our kids. But there are going to be some regulations that, that are, I think are appropriate and that they're going to be more in the third wave than they were in the second wave because the second wave was more about software and the third wave is more about 
everyday life. And so that, that's important to understand, number one. Number two, it's also important to understand that the government actually can be a catalyst for innovation. The internet itself was created in this country, not too many miles from here, by a federal agency, DARPA, that basically kind of built the fundamental technology, then a judicial decision by the Judge Green here in this country broke up Ma Bell, AT&T, the phone company, unleashed a torrent of, of competition. Congress then passed a law the Telecom Act that legalized access to the internet. When we started AOL, it was illegal, illegal for consumers or businesses to connect to the internet. It was only when Congress, you know, kind of passed that. So there are examples where where the you know the engagement has been helpful in unleashing uh, uh, new industries, whether it be funding basic research or kind of setting the, the rules of the road. And then things people do around investment incentives, tax policy, absolutely have a, an impact in terms of how much capital flows to the entrepreneurs. So in general, yes, I understand why this sort of like, you know, say, keep the government out of my way. Let me, let me build my company makes sense. But I encourage you to think of it in a different context, both based on the history, based on things like the internet where governments have been important and many other technologies, not just the, the internet, GPS technology, weather data, many other things came out of essentially government you know, investments that then those innovations then went into the, into the marketplace. And what are the policies and and we'll see how this plays out in in, uh, in Europe. But policies around immigration, policies around you know tax incentives, absolutely do have an impact in terms of the, the climate for uh, for entrepreneurship. And in these third wave sectors, there has to be more of a recognition that when you're dealing with such fundamental parts of our, our lives, there are going to be some regulations. At least engage and try to have the right kind of regulations for these 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 third wave sectors. Just kind of put your head in the sand. Just wish the government would go away, kind of a hyper-libertarian view that sometimes you do here in places like, like Silicon Valley. I just don't think it's constructive or realistic, particularly as we move into the third wave. Thank you. David, thank you for your question. Uh, so, see, we've got a comment uh, in response to some of your comments on AI that I, I'm thinking uh, Dan Reutman would love you to respond to. So he says, protection against AI is perhaps just teaching people how to make themselves irreplaceable. Almost all soft skills and a lifelong learning mindset are all consistent with a focus on education and disrupting that. What's your thought? I agree. Uh, that's what I was sort of trying to say. That there are some things that, that people can do and machines can't do. Obviously, the, 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 there's a big, vigorous debate that machines over time can do more and more things. And obviously, they will be able to do more and more things. But there's some things that, that even you know, 20, 30 years you know, from now or even longer that you know, people likely could do you know, more than machines. The other thing around this whole debate around uh, jobs and, and you know the tech, the disruption of of the of, of the, the job market. There's, there's, there's a couple of things that are worth you know noting. One is that, and I happened to be at a conference at the Vatican about uh, six months ago with the Pope, and sponsored by you know uh, Fortune and, and Time, a, a global forum. He made a very interesting point that that jobs are not just about income; it's about purpose and dignity. So we can't just assume that there's going to be this disruption of jobs because of, of, of new technologies and just immediately say, well, therefore we need universal basic income or some kind of you know, safety net. Maybe we do end up needing that, but let's first take a shot at creating jobs and, and do that in a broader way, not just betting on software companies in Silicon Valley, but entrepreneurs all over the country, around the country, indeed all around the world, some of which will surprise us and create thousands or, 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 or tens of thousands of jobs. That's important. And the second is to look back at history, that 200 years ago, over 90% of us worked on farms. Mm -hmm. Now it's less than 2%. So 88% basically lost their jobs because of automation. You, know, you can now do you know, farm much more efficiently because of all the technologies that have been developed the last you know, two centuries. But the good news is we followed that by creating things like the Industrial Revolution and then creating things like the Digital Revolution. So all that job loss was offset by job you know, creation. So how do we continue to have that? And it gets harder and harder, and, and some of these technologies like AI do create more and more risk, but how do we back the entrepreneurs that might have those crazy ideas that will turn into the industries of, of, of tomorrow and do that, not just in a few places, but everywhere, not just in this country, but all around the world. I think that's the best path to try to make sure that we have a bright you know, innovation economy and a more inclusive economy as well. I think that's a great point on automation. We've got another uh, type in question here that I'm going to ask you. Steve, uh, this is from AK. If you were a student entering the university, what would you study and what would you tell students entering university this year? Which area should they focus on for the future? So I, I think that that ties into your, your third wave and I'm sure. Yeah, I, I think, I think it, to me, I, I think I, I find it's hard to tell people 
what they should do because it's hard to know what they're good at and what they'd be passionate about. So part of this is figuring out how to link their, their skill set and their, and their passions to opportunity. And for everybody, it will be a little bit different. But I would lean into some of these third wave sectors. I, I think that people will be surprised by the, the opportunities that emerge in, in, the, in something like you know, healthcare, for example. It's super complicated. It, you know, it, it, it's going to require you know, real, real perseverance. But you know, can we create ways to provide better health outcomes with greater convenience at lower cost, I think we can. And I think a lot of people are, are trying to. In education, can we, you know, recognizing that people, a lot of people learn differently, some are more visual learners, for example, how do we create more personalized, adaptive approaches to learning? So it is, it is really much more kind of customized based on your learning style and your, your, your interest. That also is complicated. Uh, but you know, requires a you know, focus. Can we rethink food? It's a five trillion dollar industry. Most of the brands that you know, you know, are still on the shelves are brands I grew up with. Many of which are not particularly healthy. How do you create a new generation of, of brands, and not just in the stores, but on streets, restaurants, and other other kinds of things? So there are all kinds of opportunities out there. You have to decide which things kind of you feel most passionate about, most connected to. There's sort of like there's something I want to do there, and then figure out how to build a team working with you to take take that idea and, and run with it. So while we wait for another question to come in, I always like to ask this one of smart, successful people, and it doesn't have to be business advice, but what's the best advice you've ever gotten and who gave it to you? Well, the best advice really comes down to basic. Everybody in YPO has heard it a million times, but ultimately it's about people. And if you've got the right you know, people around the, you know, the table, or uh, Jim Collins said on, on the bus, you know, mm -hmm. kind of working together the right way, you know, headed in the right direction, focused on the right things. Anything is possible. You don't have the right people. Nothing is possible. So ultimately, it goes back to the idea that entrepreneurship is a, is a team sport and, and just constantly kind of reflecting on your team and, you know, what, where, where, where are the strengths, where are the weaknesses. More importantly, where, where is it going to need to be three years from now, five years from now, and how do you get in front of that and you know, sometimes make the changes you need to, to take on the, you know, the next cha you know, chapter and, and take on the next you know, challenge. So ultimately, I think it, it comes down to people. There's a great Thomas Edison you know, quote from over a century ago, one of you know, America's greatest inventors, created General Electric and a bunch of other, other things. It, it, his quote was, vision without execution is hallucination. <laughs> so having the idea, having a vision is important, obviously, but ultimate execution and execution is ultimately uh, around, you know, people. Okay, great. Actually, Keith Alper, chairman of YPO Innovation Week, he has a question for you, so we'll bring him in. Hi, Keith. Well, I have 90 questions, Steve, but I'm just going to ask one. Um, you know, there are a lot of companies, and by the way, YPOers are involved in investing startups, they're doing startups, we have thousands of members, but you know, I know you look at a lot of deals. Can you share one or two companies you're excited about that we haven't heard about? Remember, like, Slack came out and we're like, how did Microsoft miss it? How did Google? Slack was nowhere. Two years later, it is where it is. What are one or two companies you're really excited about that we should either be investing in or using right now in our businesses as CEOs globally? Well, to, to the, we, we were a relatively recent investment in both private companies, so, but, but I think are interesting and reflective of what I was talking about earlier. One is in the food business. A company called Sweet Green started in the D.C. area about 10 years ago. Now I've expanded to, from D.C. to you know, Boston, New York, San Francisco, uh, uh, Los Angeles, Chicago, and basically in the fast casual business, kind of going after the fast food industry, some of the giants like McDonald's with, with a healthier you know, kind of option using a lot of technology, smartphones, about a third of all orders now are on, on people's phones. They just walk in and walk out. They already, you know, are prepaid. And so that's an example of essentially disrupting a big sector, you know, the, you know, the food industry that, that's ripe for, you know, disruption. So it's more on the, on the, on the, on the food side. On the technology side, I referenced this earlier, there's a company called Uptake founded by Brad Keywell, one of the founders or co-founders of, of Groupon in, in Chicago. He started a new company focused on precision analytics. It's really gone, grown like, you know, crazy. It you know just started you know three years ago. As I said earlier, now coming up on a thousand employees, and and you know they're partnering with with companies who really have significant kind of data challenges, and and creating whole services in partnership with those companies uh, to take those services to scale. One other one that I that I think is really fascinating. I'll be with them in a, in a few days when I'm in, in Detroit. It's a company called Chinola. The thing I love about Chinola, basically, a, a started as a watch company, and now they're moving into other. You know, product categories. They founded with the idea, the mission of creating jobs in Detroit, to basically taking displaced auto workers and retraining them to make watches and, and other products. And now they're scaling around the country, indeed, around the, 
you know, the, the world, and, and that's more of a consumer products company, but it's very impact driven, you know, kind of purpose driven. So some of those are examples of some of our, 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 our recent uh, investments that I think will, 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 will surprise people over the next five or 10 years. Two notes from me. Number one is I think I'm personally uh, part of the success of Sweet Green because I eat there multiple times a week. Thank week. you. Thank it's you. For amazing. And I can't believe it took me an hour to bring that up to you, but I'm a huge fan. <laughs> And you just mentioned Brad Keywell, and uh, he points out he is a YPO from Chicago, which is a, a new shout out for him. Um, I think we've got time for one more question here, and it's from Rafael Lizquierdo. He's asking, what's missing in Latin America for a strong entrepreneurial culture to emerge? Do you have any thoughts on that, Steve? Well, I think there are some parts of Latin America where there is, is strength and a momentum, but uh, we, it's likely generally the same challenge we have within the United States. There are a lot of people around the world who look at the United States and say it's the most innovative entrepreneur nation, and, and in many ways it still is. But that's really in a few places, places like you know, Silicon Valley. Most of the country, most of the United States, uh, still has challenges in terms of supporting entrepreneurs. Most of the YPOers on, you know, who are, are tuning in have seen that. They, 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 various parts of the country, and they've, they've obviously been successful because otherwise they wouldn't be part of YPO, but it was often a struggle to get going. It was harder to raise capital. It was harder to get the talent. It was harder to get notice. It was harder to get the, the partnership. So the dynamics that we, you know, we see in, in, in the, across the country are similar to the dynamics we see in Latin America or Africa or other, other places. How do you create strong, uh, thriving startup communities by creating more of that network effect, by creating more of that sense of possibility, by evangelizing what's happening there. So there is a, a magnet for talent, is a magnet uh, for, for capital. And it takes time, but, but eventually uh, it, it can it, it happen. And the other piece is to, to kind of try to link that with some you know, local, regional expertise, dom domain expertise that particularly advantages you know, companies in, 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 that, in a particular you know, sector. doesn't mean you only focus on those companies in those sectors, but picking some uh, sector or two that really are strong is, is an important way for any city, region, country to, to really kind of rise up and, and be much more of a player uh, in terms of innovation. Great. Well, Steve, I'm going to wrap this up, but I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to kick off uh, YPO Innovation Week with us. It was a real honor and pleasure to speak with you, and I know your work is really important to the community, and um, you're making a big difference out there, so we really appreciate it. Well, thank you, and thank you for all, all your success and everything you're doing. I know many of you are very actively involved in kind of, you know, kind of paying it forward, figuring out how to be supportive of the next generation of entrepreneurs, how to be supportive of the, your, your community. And, and it really is important. People are really looking to the successful entrepreneurs to kind of lead the way into the future to help level the playing field in terms of the opportunity, help the, the, the rest rise. So for those of you who are doing it, thank you. And for those of you who aren't doing it, please, please engage. Please roll up your sleeves and, 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 uh, and, and focus on supporting the entrepreneurs in, in, your, in your sectors and in your region. It's, it's really important. Fantastic. Well, Steve, thank you so much again, and I'm going to send it back over to uh, Keith Alper. So, Keith, take it away. Oh, great. Uh, thank you very much. And, Steve, if you can hang on, and Kate, uh, just we're going to do a two-minute wrap-up. First of all, the capitalism in me um, wants to thank Steve for everything he's done, but also Steve also is one of the owners, is the owner of Exclusive Resorts, which many YPOers are members of YPO uh, of Exclusive Resorts, and I know you guys have sponsored YPO before. So, thank you very much. And and if you guys are interested in great vacations, look up Exclusive Resorts. I want to thank all of our members for joining in. And this will be reposted on YPO and on the CNBC uh, Facebook page. So uh, thank you there. Um, first of all, thank you, Steve, for taking time out of your day to talk with our many YPOers around the globe. They got a great uh, perspective. And Kate, thank you for joining us today. And you're going to also be with us later in the week. And we again want to thank CNBC for their partnership with YPO. Um, we have over 100 champions. These are volunteer YPOers that are making Innovation Week work around the world, from Tel Aviv, Silicon Valley, Hong Kong, Zimbabwe. So thank you guys for what you do and your dedication to YPO and our members. Um, Steve, I know Jiggs, uh, Jiggs Davis is a friend of yours. Jiggs yeah. is a YPOer. He invented our forum product, probably one of the biggest products of YPO for the last 30 or 40 years. But we want to thank uh, Jiggs for being involved. And um, we've got a lot of upcoming casts this week. Uh, later today, actually, there's a business forum at 6 p.m. That's a GCC you can look into. And then also this week, uh, Brad Feld is going to be on with us Thursday, May 11th at 10 a.m. Uh, we're trying to do this easy and make the easy button. So thank you, guys. Uh, we really appreciate everybody being on and have a great week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.